This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers Lecture 11 in Seminar 2. Previously, we discussed Freud's earliest model of the mind, which he based upon his understanding of thermodynamics and the neurology of his day. This is only the first of four different models presented to us over the course of Freud's work. According to Lacan, we are provided a second model in the interpretation of dreams, a third based on his later theory of the libido. Finally, a fourth model is achieved in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Lecture 11 leads us into the second model found as developed in Chapter 7 of the Interpretation of Dreams, which this lecture and the next are based on. In this video, I address the following questions. 1. What are the sensor and resistance according to Freud? 2. What are they according to Lacan? And 3. How are we to think about the relationship between Freud and Lacan in light of their respective understandings of resistance and censorship? If you benefit from this video and want to support this work, please consider liking it, sharing it, and subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have the means and desire to, you can now support this work on Patreon. Link is below. This lecture by Lacan offers an opportunity to highlight how difficult it is to understand him without referencing the Freudian text. There are numerous points in this lecture that we can get lost in if we don't understand what it's in reference to. Reading chapter 7 of The Interpretation of Dreams prior to lecture 11 clears up many of these difficulties. This is especially the case in Lacan's discussion on the differences between resistance and censorship. There are some back and forth bickerings, uh, it would seem, between Lacan and Valabrega on the conceptual relation between the two. Let's begin with Freud's text and see where we as readers may encounter the difficulties and see how Lacan attempts to dissolve this confusion. In chapter 7, Freud writes that the censor is responsible for secondary revisions, distortions, and the forgetting of dreams. It represses the deeper links between the manifest images, giving rise to associations that are superficial and even nonsensical. Freud uses a helpful metaphor here of passing through a mountain range. The censor is like the interruption of traffic through the main roads due to a flood. Nonetheless, certain communications are maintained through inconvenient, steep pathways that run through the mountains and are used by hunters. Though usually operating in the shadows, on occasion, the sensor no longer conceals its activities, as in the case of what Freud calls deliria, whereby one undergoes highly disconnected and perhaps incoherent experiences due to the ruthless deletion of whatever the sensor disapproves of. Freud offers yet another metaphor to understand this deletion function of the censor, this time as a government censor that receives all foreign newspapers. Before allowing them to enter the country and be read, certain undesirable pieces of information are blacked out from stories. This is the version read by its citizens. Confusion between censorship and resistance comes in because Freud talks about resistance as performing a function very similar to censorship here. Freud defines resistance broadly as whatever interrupts the progress of analytic work. In the case of dreams, however, it's described as the chief agent of forgetting dream material. Resistance and censorship are even used in the same sentence, such as where Freud writes, doubt whether a dream or certain of its details have been correctly reported is once more a derivative of the dream censorship, of resistance to the penetration of the dream thoughts into consciousness. Elsewhere, Freud writes, whenever one psychical element is linked with another by an objectionable or superficial association, there is also a legitimate and deeper link between them, which is subjected to the resistance of the censorship. These overlapping functions and almost interchangeable use of terms would reasonably lead many to conclude that they are the same thing. Yet, Lacan is adamant that censorship is not resistance. He cites the fact that to even say the resistance of the censorship is already to differentiate them. Otherwise, the expression, the resistance of the censorship, would be a redundancy and equivalent to saying the censorship of the censorship. I'm not sure this argument is entirely convincing, as one can say the flashing of the lightning, which could be considered a redundancy of sorts, but it can also communicate an essential but non-comprehensive property of the lightning it's phenomenal rather than physical features. And either way, it's a perfectly acceptable expression. But let us turn to Lacan now and see how he presents the difference. 
Lacan defines censor as arising from and residing on the same register as the law and not at the level of the subject or individual. Together with the law, it constitutes a full universe, giving us our cultural world. However, the censor has a peculiar relation to the law as it is what is linked to it insofar as the law is not understood. As mentioned in seminar one, the superego is the misrecognition of the law, a law unto itself. I'm not sure if Lacan fully equates the censor with the superego. He mentions them in this lecture as if they can be separated to some degree, saying that the superego and censorship are on the same register as the law. If I was to use Lacan's own logic here, then I would say that his use of them in this sentence would only be necessary if they are not the same thing. Regardless of however they may be different, where they converge is in their misrecognition of the law. Such misrecognition is a fundamental possibility for any primordial law, especially those that entail the threat of death. When it comes to resistance, Lacan presents two meanings. In the strict or more narrow meaning, it's an effect of the ego. In the broader understanding of the term, he draws directly from Freud's conceptualization of resistance in chapter 7, saying that it is everything that halts analytic work and adds that resistance is not limited to a psychic property of the subject, but can be related to, for example, an extrinsic accident. It only needs to interfere with the work of interpretation to qualify as resistance. Lacan adds that the censor has nothing to do with either meaning. Though, he adds, it has a great deal more to do with the second, broader meaning. This claim by Lacan appears to me as somewhat confusing because to say the censor has nothing to do with either, and then in the same sentence to say it has something to do with one of them, seems like a contradiction. I went into the French version of the text to see if something had been lost in translation. There, Lacan says, La censeur n'a rien à faire avec la résistance, ni au premier sens, ni, mais beaucoup plus quand même au second. The second translation is pretty much how I would translate it from French to English. So that doesn't seem to be the issue. What I think was meant here is that both senses of resistance are not equivalent to censorship, though the broader meaning of resistance has some functional relationship with the censor. And this would account for how Lacan interprets Freud's phrase, the resistance of the censorship. That resistance is a function of the censor, but not equivalent to it, as resistance is both broader and more narrow in scope than whatever role it may play with the censor. This leads to my third question. How are we to think of the relationship between Freud and Lacan in light of this conversation around resistance and censorship? Whenever I pose a possible criticism or identify an inconsistency in Lacan, I always do so with great hesitancy as I recognize that more keen eyes may be able to resolve the difficulties that I'm having. But if I have, in fact, accurately identified a problematic argument in Lacan, it has little bearing, for me at least, on Lacan's own theory. It only problematizes the manner in which he considers himself consistent with Freud on certain points. This is one of the instances where it feels like he's trying a little too hard to make his own approach be Freud's rather than let it be his own. I'm convinced that it is difficult, if not impossible, to understand what Freud means if we don't situate his thought in light of Freud's writings. But at the same time, my observation is that Lacan is not a perfect repetition of Freud, but a repetition with an important difference. In fact, it may be the differences and indeed contradictions a la Hegel between Lacan and Freud where perhaps some of the greatest truths of Lacan reside. In this sense, I think it's fruitful to interpret the relation between Lacan and Freud as one would the relationship between the discoursing subject and the speaking subject, and that it's in the contradictions where the truth makes itself known. This is a reason why this series is entitled Thought in Motion, because Lacan does not just deliver us his truth in a pretty package. Rather, he performs it for us, just as Plato, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche performed their truths rather than offer up a systematic logical argument. This is the philosophical tradition I would place Lacan within. What this particular apparent contradiction discloses here is the emphasis Lacan places on the distinction between the imaginary and the symbolic as well as how language functions within each register. Lacan's strong insistence to distinguish resistance and censorship, perhaps to degrees greater than Freud emphasized, reveals how pivotal such a distinction is for his own thought. How then can we think of this distinction between resistance and censorship in Lacanian terms alone? 
Resistance as an effect of the ego is fundamentally a misrecognition of the subject and the subject's desire. It is the resistance to a signifier that would bring that desire into being. This is most evident in analysis where the aim is the recognition of desire in and as speech. In contrast, the censor is also a kind of misrecognition, but this time of the law rather than the subject and the subject's desire. Second, whereas resistance breaks the fundamental rule of psychoanalysis by interrupting speech, the censor expresses itself in the interruption of the discourse linked to the law. Finally, it seems that the censor operates at the front end of the dream, giving rise to its form and preventing its deeper structures from being made clear. It's also what renders desire unconscious, making dreams as wish fulfillments a possibility in the first place. Resistance then happens at the back end of the dream, so to speak. It's the ego's refusal to allow into speech what the censor has in fact made available in its secondary revisions and distortions. This resistance is far more problematic than the distortions of the censor. In fact, it's the distortions and piecemeal memories that are the significant material for analytic interpretation, where the real important work happens. And this is a point that Freud makes pretty clear in chapter 7. In Lacanian terms, full speech is a discourse that brings the censor's activities into analysis. Resistance hinders this full speech. The ego refuses to speak of what the censor provides, or it pretends to a coherence and understanding of the dream in a manner that actually covers over its actual contradictions. This is my current understanding of Lacan on this difference, which of course is filtered through my own speech, and so subject to its own and unintended contradictions, just as they may be for Lacan in speaking on behalf of Freud. This is how, in a sense, repetition works. We all get to repeat the errors of those who have had an influence on our thinking, but in a manner that does not so much repeat their errors as create new ones. And rather than some kind of movement into falsity, such errors mark the progress of truth itself. Of course, this is only done by authentically trying to adhere to Lacan and not by intentionally making up stuff. Uh, but it's in the process of trying to repeat with intention that the errors of truth emerge. I'd like to thank uh, my very first Patreon supporter, David Guevara, who signed up for the bonus video I'll be producing every month. Thank you. And again, if you would like to support uh, me on Patreon, the link is below. In the next video, we consider lecture 12 and examine the concept of repression. As always, thank you for watching. And until next time, be well.